Colonialism is not a thinking machine, nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties. It is violence in its natural state, and it will only yield when confronted with greater violence. It is violence in its natural state. Colonialism is not a thinking machine. Colonialism is not a thinking machine, nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties. It is violence in its natural state, and it will only yield when confronted with greater violence.
two weeks after an 11-year-old boy is killed in a standoff between colonists and British officials, soaring tensions in Boston threaten to explode into open violence at the slightest spark. On the cold winter night of March 5, 1770, an angry mob hurls snowballs at nervous sentries guarding a customs house. Suddenly, there's the blast of a musket. More shots follow. After the last musket is fired, five colonists lie dead in what the Sons of Liberty will dub the Boston Massacre. With the Boston Massacre, tensions escalated dramatically because until this point, it still had been largely a political argument. Now, it's a matter of a show of force. Now, people have died. There is much more at stake than there had been before. Boston's colonial leaders put the Redcoat soldiers on trial for murder. The lawyer defending the soldiers is a surprising choice, John Adams, one of the leading voices of discontent. These men, loyal servants of the crown. He thought that uh, it was critical uh, to uphold the rights of the accused uh, as a sacred uh, traditional British liberty. It is our duty and our obligation to look out for the mother country. And also to prove to the mother country that the American people was not one big lynch mob. Besides seeing their acquittal as a matter of justice, it's hoped it will also calm the friction in Boston. John Adams made a very plausible argument that the British soldiers who fired in the crowd were firing in self-defense. Adams also stacks the deck by packing the jury with loyalists. The verdict is handed down. Your grace, we find the defendants not guilty. The verdict enrages many patriots, but it does the trick of pacifying British officials Parliament even repeals some of their taxes, and America and Britain step back from the brink of an escalating conflict. Revolutions rarely happen overnight, and the American Revolution was no exception. It was a slow burn of frustration and anger that built up month after month, year after year. One of the crucial moments in the saga was the Tea Party, brought on by the passage of the Tea Act in 1773. Here are five important points to fully understand the scope of the Tea Act and why it was so important to the birth of our nation. In the 1770s, one of the most valuable commodities in the Western world was tea. Tea was new, it was exotic, exactly the kind of thing that's easy to sell. But maybe not that easy. Because by 1773, decreased sales left the British East India Company with a surplus of over 17 million pounds of tea just sitting and rotting in warehouses in England. The country's biggest and most important company was in serious trouble. The British East India Company needed a bailout, and they looked to the North American colonies for a solution. Normally, British tea merchants sold tea to American traders in London at a markup, who would then sell the tea to colonists. The British government thought, why are we using American merchants to sell our tea when we can just ship it there ourselves? So they cut out the middleman by passing the Tea Act of 1773 which allowed the British East India Company to ship and sell their tea directly to the colonies at a lower cost. The idea being that a British monopoly on tea sales in America would ease the company's financial burden. Now, it's important to understand that the Tea Act was part of a larger effort by the British Crown to squeeze as much money from the colonies as possible. The Brits were heavily in debt from the French and Indian War, and the colonies became their own private ATM of sorts. A few years earlier, Parliament passed the Townsend Acts, which taxed items that colonists relied on. Lead, glass, paper, paint, and of course, tea. The backlash was so severe that the British repealed all the Townsend Acts, except for one, the tea tax. Colonial tea merchants were furious. 
not only had the TAC taken away their source of income, but they would still be taxed through the roof to buy their own tea. Colonists had to take matters into their own hands. December 16th, 1773. Americans fought back by boycotting British tea entirely, allowing imports to sit on the docks and spoil. Colonial Governor Thomas Hutchinson ordered that American colonists buy the tea, but they had other plans. That night, a group of about 60 Bostonians called the Sons of Liberty, wearing Mohawk headdresses and war paint, boarded three British East India Company trading ships and dumped 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor. The Boston Tea Party was celebrated across the colonies as a symbol of defiance against the tyrannical British rule. The British doubled down in response, passing what became known as the Intolerable Acts, a series of laws designed to punish colonial America for their resistance. They closed Boston Harbor, imposed martial law in Massachusetts, and allowed British troops to shack up in colonists' homes whenever it was necessary. For the colonists, the Intolerable Acts would be the straw that broke the camel's back. While the Tea Act was not extremely potent on its own, it was part of a series of events that snowballed towards the revolution in the 13 colonies. The phrase, no taxation without representation, wasn't just a slogan. It was the result of years of unfair treatment by the British Crown, the Tea Act serving as a prime example. America's judicial system is the notion that no ruler, no government official, or elected leader is above the law. It's a tenet recorded in every one of our founding documents, but that revolutionary idea didn't originate here. It came from a 13th century peace treaty that has shaped the free world for 800 years. The Magna Carta today, the principles contained therein, affect the lives of nearly two billion people in over a hundred countries around the world. There are only four surviving original copies of the 1215 Magna Carta. One of them is currently on display at the British Library in London with two of its much younger but more famous 18th century cousins, the Declaration of Independence and the US Bill of Rights. In the Declaration of Independence, you have America standing up to a tyrannical king, but people are ironically looking back to Magna Carta, which is, of course, a document granted originally by an English king. You describe it as Britain's greatest or most important export? Eight of the ten in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution of the United States, are straight from Magna Carta. Magna Carta, Latin for Great Charter, was drawn up at a time when the divine right of kings and the feudal system was the law of the land, whereby a monarch's right to rule was not bound by any earthly authority, but came directly from Almighty God. There was only one lawmaker, the king. 
And that meant life or death. It meant imprisonment. It meant all sorts of penalties that could be whimsical. And in King John's case, it was whimsical. He abused his power to such a degree that he became one of the most loathed and reviled rulers in English history. Crowned at Westminster Abbey in 1199, he inherited the throne from his brother, Richard the Lionhearted. Unlike his brother, John was inept, greedy, corrupt, and showed mercy to no one. In the first five years of his reign, he lost most of his inherited lands in France through military and foreign policy blunders. Chronicler Gervais of Canterbury called him John Softsword. His wars were unpopular and costly, so he placed heavy tax burdens on his subjects to finance them. He was very good at fundraising. He was selling off widows to widowers and instructing them that they had to marry this woman, and if they didn't want to, then he'd fine them. If he did want to, he'd take uh, money for it. In the meantime, she might try to bribe him to stay single because she couldn't stand the sight of the particular chap he was offering. And so he was collecting money from all three. If the barons owed him money, King John took their children as hostages until full payment was made. He would also degrade the wives of his noblemen with lewd and lustful behavior and added insult to injury with more taxes. And that was the thing that really led to the theme of no taxation without representation. He tripled their taxes. Perhaps his most insidious offense was his abuse of individual rights. He meted out judgment and punishment without due process. When his Welsh barons threatened rebellion in 1212, he had 28 of their sons hanged. Matthew Paris, a 13th century historian, famously wrote, Foul as it is, hell itself is made fouler by the presence of King John. The political climate in January of 1215 boiled over with revolt among his beleaguered yet well-armed barons. They confronted the heavily guarded John here at London's Temple Church and demanded that he fulfill his sworn oath and restore the ancient liberties granted to them a century earlier by King Henry I. According to one historian of the time, John scoffed and vowed he'd never grant them liberties that would render him their slave. A seriously tense and divided standoff ensued. By spring of that year, the barons renounced their allegiance to the crown and took its capital, London. With John the soft sword cornered and forced into negotiations, he chose a serene meadow called Runnymede. King John met with the barons here in this open field at Runnymede along the banks of the Thames River, two miles south of Windsor Castle to make peace. It was on June 15th, 1215, that he affixed his seal to the Magna Carta, the Great Charter. The peace treaty, originally called the Articles of the Barons, contained 63 clauses that limited the king's powers in matters of the church, courts, trade, taxes, and individual rights. So it's a potpourri of all sorts of things that are terribly important, but the absolute principal thing is the elimination of the right of divine rule of a king. The following year, King John died of dysentery and was replaced by his heir, the boy king, Henry III. Under wise counsel, King Henry amended the articles three times. It was freely issued by the new king, Henry III. So it was free from the charge that it had been issued under duress at the field of Runnymede. But I think the most important thing about Magna Carta, sort of holistically, is that it established the importance of the principle of the rule of law. Magna Carta influenced centuries of English law and laid the groundwork for establishing individual rights. There's women's rights, actually in the Magna Carta, a privilege of a widow not to be forced to marry without her consent, a women's rights. Same thing with children, there were children's rights in it. In time, many of the articles lost their relevance, but there's one today that remains the bedrock of America's judicial system. 
the key clause, which is buried in the middle of Magna Carta, it's not given any particular prominence in the document itself, but guaranteeing access to justice and the right to a fair trial. And that last clause, which is the one that's really stood the test of time and that people have looked back to over the centuries ever since, that's the one that's really at the heart of Magna Carta's fame today. Through the writings of Sir Edward Coke and others, Magna Carta and its ideas made their way to the shores of the New World, where again the king's subjects were on the verge of revolution. No taxation without representation. That's very important. It was, of course, the battle cry of the American Revolution. So they definitely looked back to Magna Carta as the embodiment of ancient rights. A medieval historian said of King John, he feared not God, nor respected men. It was, however, out of his abuses that Magna Carta emerged and over time became the cornerstone of liberty, law, and democracy. I think it's amazing in this 800th anniversary year just how much national and international interest and excitement has been uh, generated around the Magna Carta and how it's moved from being a medieval peace treaty into one of the most famous and iconic documents in the world. For CBN, this is John Jessup reporting in London on the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. In the U.S., we love our Constitution. But it wasn't always this way. Before the Constitution and government we have today, we had a sort of prototype Constitution called the Articles of Confederation, which created a nation of independent states only loosely linked together by a single Congress. The Founding Fathers intentionally designed a nation with a very weak central government. There was no judicial branch, no executive branch, so there was no president which when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, the colonists had just been through a really bad breakup with the British king, and they're not about to get back together with a government who looked just like their ex, okay? We've all made that mistake before, okay? You go and date a girl like the last girl you dated, you're gonna get hurt, okay? Don't do this to yourself. The Congress, which was just a single chamber with a delegate from every state, did have some power, like the authority to make treaties and alliances, maintain an army, and coin money but they couldn't levy the taxes to pay for those things. In fact, under the Articles of Confederation, paying federal taxes was voluntary for the states, who of course were like, mm, no thanks, we're good. The US had borrowed money from European investors and nations to pay for the Revolutionary War, but with no power to tax, the United States couldn't pay back any of those debts, creating a huge economic disaster by 1787. With no funds and limited power, the central government couldn't do much to protect peace at home. This became abundantly clear during Shays' Rebellion in 1786, when farmers in Massachusetts violently protested against the state's high taxes. So if the Articles of Confederation weren't working, why didn't they just make changes to it? Well, it was practically impossible. Amendments to the Articles needed unanimous consent, and the delegates from the 13 states had more opinions than a YouTube comment section. By the way, you should comment on this video right now. Say something nice about me. This weak Congress and a broke, ineffective federal government eventually proved to be too much of a burden on the United States. Because when 13 different state governments held all the power, nothing was getting accomplished. The Founding Fathers found this out the hard way. So they went back to the drawing board, drafting a new and improved constitution, which is still the law of our land today.
gonna knock you up with some feds and anti-feds in this quick lecture, guys. We've touched upon it in other lectures, but I think it deserves special focus because it's way, way important. Hey. So giddy up for the learning, guys. Why don't we go get her done right now? Feds and anti-feds. So, the summer of 1787 is going to bring us to these two groups, the Feds and the Anti-Feds, during the Constitutional Convention, really during the ratification process. You have to remember that the delegates of the convention in 1787 in Philadelphia that wrote that Constitution did it by bypassing the old Constitution. They violated the Articles of Confederation where you needed 13 out of 13 states agreeing in order to amend itself. So they're not amending the Articles of Confederation, they're throwing that stuff in the garbage and they're starting all over, which is revolutionary and illegal. But either way you cut it, they write that constitution, and certainly you can go watch other videos that talk about what they put in that constitution, but the main concept is they're strengthening the role of the federal government. In a sense, they're really creating centralized authority with taxing power, and that's a pretty big deal. So when they go to ratify that sucker, we have basically two groups that kind of break out. We have the Federalists, which becomes the Federalist Party. Really, the only Federalist president was John Adams. James Madison was a Federalist originally. I think George George Washington would probably classify him as a Federalist, but you also have big names like Alexander Hamilton, you have John Jay, you have some big heavy hitters that are going to argue in those Federalist papers, those 85 essays, that this is the right balance in Federalism and this is what we need. We need a large republic with a stronger central government to be the glue to keep us all together. And you know, even in the ratification process, it shows you a lot in terms of them really seeing us a country of people. They don't go to the state legislatures for this constitution constitutional convention ratification process. They go to people conventions in the states. And all states had elections where they elected delegates to this new convention and each state voted. And eventually nine out of 13 states were needed to ratify that. And they kind of just made that number up. But federalists are gonna be the ones who wrote the constitution and who believe in this stronger role of the federal government, a larger republic. You know, if anything, they would say the states have a role, the states have the Senate. The Senate was elected by state legislatures. They represent the states. The House represents the people. This is the perfect balance. But when we go to that ratification process, we also have a large number of people that are turning against this new constitution, and they are labeled anti-federalists. Originally, they wanted to be called the Federalists because they thought they had the right balance but they got nicknamed the Anti-Feds, so there you go. We have Anti-Feds like Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, um, William Randolph, George Clinton, George Mason, and even Thomas Jefferson, even though they shipped him off to Paris. The Anti-Feds' main argument is, number one, this is an illegal move. Number two, where are our liberties? We don't trust this new big federal government. They're gonna take our rights away. And they're not gonna be looking out for the interest of the smaller states, of the rural areas. And that's really what's represented by the Anti-Feds, rural. America, the South, farmers, debtors, as opposed to the Federalists who are really represented by manufacturers and artisans and big city interests. So that's the main two groups, guys. The Federalists, which support the new federal constitution, and you have the Anti-Feds who are really in love with the Articles of Confederation, and if anything, would be okay with maybe amending that document, but certainly not throwing it out, baby, with the bathwater. So what's going to happen? Well, eventually it's going to get ratified with 9 out of 13 states, and a bill of Rights is going to be added to the Constitution in order to garner the rest of the support, all 13 states eventually, and that's going to protect those civil liberties from the federal government as well as maintaining in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments some state power so some of those fears of the anti-feds could be calmed down a little bit. So what happens after that? The Federalist Party runs its course. We have John Adams, and after that it kind of dies away. It becomes the Whigs, and eventually it's kind of reborn as a northern nationalistic Republican Party. What happens to the Anti-Feds label themselves the Anti-Administrational Party and later become Jeffersonian Republicans or the Democratic Republicans, and that's the forerunner of the Democratic Party of the South, Andrew Jackson. So there you go, guys. We hope you know a little bit more about the Feds and the Anti-Feds, and giddy up for that. So we'll see you guys next time that you press my buttons, and always remember, where attention goes, energy flows.
Black violin, Kev's on this Will be simple, sick Come on, it's that feel good, yeah
just dance in the hum of love.
Anytime you try to look out for black folk and think you're preaching hate. And so but I don't care what they think about me. I don't want you to go out and think I'm preaching hate. But I want you to start developing some things. And everything I say to you this morning is to break that trick, that game that you're locked into. And in my Powernomics book, I call this Powernomics. Powernomics means learning how to use social economic judo. You know what I'm saying? And I want you to learn how to start flipping the script. We're going to come out of this condition because time is running out. I don't prophesy something going to happen in the future. I'll tell you the date, the time, and the place it's going to happen. And I haven't missed one yet. Now, the time is running out on us. You're now a permanent underclass. In about another seven or eight years, right in the early 20s, only 25% of the people working today would be necessary to even have a job. Only 25% were working, of those working today would be working by the year 2021. That's the first thing. Secondly, is that probably about somewhere between about 40 to 50 percent of all the black people that were alive in 1998 are going to be dead. And whether you live in Africa, the Caribbean, or America, you're going to die. You're going to die either as a direct or an indirect result of terrorism or natural disasters or man-made catastrophes. Why? Because black folk don't own and control the vital resources necessary to take care of yourselves. There are certain things that you have to do, be able to be independent, to feed yourself, clothe yourself, have food and water. There are four things you have to have to be able to survive. Food, water, energy, and medicine. We control none of those things. I didn't say have access to go to somebody else's drugstore. We don't understand the game of survivorship that's coming. And I want to make sure you put that, write that down in your book. It's coming. And that's why you're going to have major food shortages going across this country, in the United States, and water shortages that are going to throw everything out of sync. And food is going to, short is going to throw it out of sync. And black folk don't own any grocery stores. You don't own any drug stores. You don't control any water, food. It's coming. So today I want you to understand the nature of what we're going to be up against. And when the people ask me, Dr. Anson, why is it that we're always on the bottom? Well, you're on there for a very specific reason. First is because we don't understand that game. And, they've been, and it's been a game ever since the founding of the country. And we never understood the game. And the game is that the, the major societies in this country have ways of excluding you intentionally without you knowing it. They use very broad and they use very broad and ambiguous terms to give the pretense that you include an inclusion at the same time you're being excluded. They use cold words to make sure that you're never getting, your condition will never change. And let's start going through it and show you what I mean. Let's go back to the first to the Constitution as an example. The Articles of Confederation that were put up in the, in the, in the, in the 1600s said very specifically that they're going to start a slavery system in the United States. And they want to figure out which population they're going to use, but I think they've always been messing around with the black population. And, it's, and, it's, and in 1650, 
they started trying to, trying to work around enslaved black folk. And the population of whites coming into the country, pouring into the country. By 1750, the population of this country for black folk were up to 35%. White folks had already gotten alarm about that. And so back, so back in the 1600s, in the 1600s, about 1642 as an example, go back to show you, they started passing laws that try to restrict the number of blacks coming into this country. Why? Because they wanted you to be a minority. And that's why, this, and later on, when they, when they drew up the Constitution, the first act in the Constitution was what's called the first naturalization of immigration law. That says there's a zero quote on blacks coming into the country, but it's, it's a, be a white country for white Europeans only. Now, in the Constitution, here's how the coding started work. The coding came up, they says, all the people. Every time the white society says all the people, we the people, the American people, they are not talking about you. <laughs> you are the people to be excluded. That's why in the Constitution, there's no place in the Constitution, not in one instance, does it ever mention the word slave. Never does it include the word slavery. Whenever they want to start talking about black folk in the Constitution starting out in the 1600s, 1700s, what they said is they used very broad and ambiguous terms to relate to black folk. Like, those who are indebted, those who are abundant, those, that, that specific, that species of property. To make sure that, they, that what they're deciding, and they, and they used this when they, when they met to form the Constitution in Philadelphia in, the seven, in 1779, when all the so-called founding fathers got together, what they said is this. Let's not taint this document we're getting ready to create called the Constitution. Let's not taint it talking about slavery or about slaves. We're getting ready to screw over some people, but we don't want anybody to know about it. We do not, we want to keep, we want to leave no fingerprints, no fingerprints should be left on what we're getting ready to do. This is fact. For the first three days in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, they kept the doors locked while they all debated whether or not slave and slavery should show up in the Constitution and what terms they should use. And they went out of their way to say that nobody ought to use those terms. We would use very broad and ambiguous terms. So when Thomas Jefferson rewrote the Constitution, he had to write it three times to make sure that there was nothing left in there, no fingerprints left of what was gonna to happen to a certain group of people. And so when you read the Constitution, it says, we the people, you just had it. All the people, you just had it. When the Constitution says that that all men are created equal. They were talking about you. you.
for me No matter the reason it ain't I give you everything you need Even though time gets hard I know that you won't part for me I know I don't wanna lose you girl Baby As long as you're in my life I won't go crazy As long as you know you're mine Lady, all the things I've never felt, all the things I've never seen in my life, I know you drive me crazy. I know that we've been through so many things. There's no need for you to feel this way again. That is the separation of African people from their African selves, from their basic African identities. When you have an identity, it is difficult for another person to impose a set of values on you. Because having a positive identity and a solid identity is a defense against being penetrated by alien forces. A positive identity functions to locate us in the world, in space, and in time, and in history. A positive identity gives us a sense of purpose and a sense of direction. A positive identity provides us with self-knowledge and direction. A positive identity provides us with a sense of belongingness. When we say we are African, we are not merely identifying ourselves as individuals. We indicate that we belong to a people to a culture, to a nation, that we belong to a system of values, a system of perceptions, a system of behavior, folk ways and mores. A system, a, a, an identity permits us to cooperate with other people. It permits us to understand what role we must play within a particular group. An identity permits us to know our own interests. An identity permits us to provide ourselves with an evaluative system permits us to evaluate what is going on in the world. And identity prevents us, uh, provides us with a defense against possession. I've often said that we cannot be African and be slaves and subordinates of other people at the same time. We cannot be fully identified and at one with our African identity and be subordinate to another people. The uh, European, of course, recognize this immediately. That is why we, when we talk about our slave history, we often talk about the destruction of African culture. We talk about the rewriting of black history as an attempt, again, of destroying the African culture and an African personality. We recognize that the destruction of that personality, the separating of us from our culture, the separating of us from our history, is a separation of us ultimately from our identity. It means a split and a schism is created in the personality. When a schism and a split is created in the personality, the individual is made exceedingly uncomfortable. It is the first rule of brainwashing. When you wish to brainwash a person, when you wish to transform their personality, you break them from their old personality. You break them from their old memory. You make them question and doubt their previous culture, their previous learning. When you get them to begin to doubt themselves, when you get them to reject their culture, when you get them to see their past lives as, the, as negative, when you get them to feel ashamed of that past life, when you get them to feel guilty of that past life, and any good brainwasher knows this, and you check out the Moonies and any other brainwashing organization, you will see this process being put forth. Once you get that, the individual then is left in a tremendous state of confusion, in a tremendous state of ambivalence. That state is painful. It motivates the individual then to seek some kind of relief, to seek some way out. Then it becomes the function of the brainwasher to say, if you follow my way, if you accept my definition, if you do it the way I say do it, if you look at it the way I say look at it, if you value it the way I say value it, then you will feel better. See how happy we are, you know, often in these uh, 
uh, semi or quasi religious brainwashing uh, places you see the people running around smiling and they're all glory and they're all happy and they're all loving and they're all you know and here's this confused person cut off from family cut off from from his community cut off from everything he's known uh, and is in filled with pain and yet these people seem to be so loving they seem to be so brotherly they seem to be so sisterly then let me get what they have and of course these people are here to say see if you thought the way we thought if you uh, look at things the way we look at it, you'll be happy, you'll be one, you'll be accepted. Then often the individual then accepts the values and the orientation of the brainwashing group and then becomes a part of that group. The splitting then of the African personality is a necessary process in inculcating into that personality an alien personality, an alien spirit creating the personality of servitude. It makes possible then, in that African personality, that is the split African personality, makes it possible then for the African to begin to believe the lies, to accept the European distortion, to accept European uh, uh, reality, to accept then the stereotypes the Europeans have projected. And it's very interesting as you ride the subways uh, today and it becomes an embarrassing event to watch our youngsters use the degrading term they use again and again so loudly, so unselfconsciously. When I grew up, that you, the idea of using this term in public, the idea of letting white folk hear you using that term, calling one, uh, letting any other group of people hear you referring to yourself by that term was unbelievable. But now this seems to be the coin of the realm. And we hear it all the time, yeah, that nigga did this, that nigga that, and you know, it just goes again and again and again. People must have been destroyed in many ways to talk about themselves in public and to be this way so loudly and, and so clearly. You must then break the African person from his African identity in order for this to happen. And this, of course, is what happens. Nature abhors a vacuum we say. In other words, where there's a vacuum, there's an attempt for that vacuum to be filled in some way or another. And of course we see that when we suck sodas with a straw, we create a vacuum of course, and that vacuum sucks into it whatever we are drinking. When you create a vacuum in the personality as separating the African personality from his African identity, then there is an attempt for that personality to suck into itself something else to fill its emptiness. When the European then is in control of information, when the European is in control of so-called knowledge, when the European is in control of so-called reality, in control of definition and so forth, it will be these things that are sucked into the African personality. When the European projects lies as truth, this will then be these lies sucked in through the vacuum of the split African personality and accepted as, as truth. And then the, this personality, these sucked in lies, these sucked in perceptions, these sucked in distorted uh, views of reality will take on a life of their own. They will take on a structure and an organization and represent themselves as a personality. At that point, the African personality becomes possessed by a spirit. It, when we hear, as I said earlier, about the, the black boys and our children talking that language on the subway and speaking the way they speak. In a way, it is not they who speak. It is the spirit in them that speaks using their mouths, using their bodies. When they then believe the lies that they cannot learn as well or better than any other people, when they are afraid to try, when they are afraid of failure, when they are afraid of success, when they are afraid to challenge the European. You see, we talk about racism, but I don't think we are yet really ready to do something about it. Because doing something about it in the ultimate sense means preventing and neutralizing the perpetrators of racism. Ultimately, it means, ladies and gentlemen, removing the Europeans' ability to perpetrate racism in the world. Not getting the European to love us, 
Not getting the European to so assimilate with us or to accept us, but getting the European in a position where no matter how scandalous he is in terms of us, he can do a doggone thing about it. Because we then have the power in and of ourselves to defend ourselves against his insult and against his slander. Ultimately then the removal of racism for the world would mean the ultimate neutralizing of European power. But many of us are not ready yet to take on that task. Many of us are still afraid that we are not up to that task, that we cannot defeat the European, that we cannot neutralize the European. So we have opted for a, a, a some kind of armistice, some type of suing for peace, some type of getting along, because we figure that is the best that we can do. Then we, in this sense then, we will be continued to be possessed by an alien spirit. And that alien spirit then will speak to us. When we then fail to believe in ourselves as people, it is because that spirit has taken over us and it says to us what the European has said. You can't succeed. You can't run the world on your own. You are incapable of having a culture. Without us, you could, wouldn't have VCRs. You wouldn't have TVs because, see, you're not technical and you know you love it. You wouldn't have compact disc and you know you're into your music, you see. And you wouldn't have this and you wouldn't have that. Uh, you know, uh, Europeans are mathematically uh, gifted and you are not mathematically oriented and Jews can count money and you don't know how to keep money. That means that there's a spirit in, in us and that spirit whispers to us and it keeps us from attempting many of the things that we should attempt. This can only occur when we have been separated from our African selves. The alienated African then lacks insight and clear realistic vision of himself and of the world and find himself at a loss as how to extricate himself from servitude and damnation. In other words, as long as we accept that alien spirit in ourselves, we will be confused as to how we are going to get out of our situation. Today, we see a lot of confusion in terms of the education of black children. Journey, journey. Get into this point. Still a ways to go. 